Hello and welcome to Law 2023 Online, uh, Commercial Property Autumn, Shape the Debate, with me, Mark Shelton, and Richard Snape. And uh, today's Q&A is due to last one hour. It's going to cover your pre-submitted questions. Um, so I'll start off just with uh, briefly introducing myself and Richard. Uh, I'm Mark Shelton. I've worked in major commercial law firms for 29 years. Um, as a property litigator, I've acted for a range of clients from FTSE 100 investment companies and major corporate occupiers uh, down to small businesses and individuals. And uh, commercial property management law is my area. And uh, as well as advising on the structuring and the documentation of transactions, I've also conducted a wide range of commercial property disputes, um, acting both for landlords and for tenants. Now, uh, I'm a non-practicing solicitor and I work as a commercial property management law trainer, uh, putting, I hope, my experience to uh, good use in training both, both lawyers and surveyors. So um, as part of Law 2023 Online Commercial Property, uh, my sessions, which hopefully you've, you, you viewed, are alienation consents, escape routes for landlords, and uh, licenses to alter, essential content pitfalls and nice surprises. Um, so... Uh, Richard is, um, uh, has been the head of professional support at David Jones Bold since uh, 2022, and he speaks at uh, numerous courses for law societies all over the country, various public courses, in-house seminars within solicitors firms, and has also talked extensively to local authorities and central government bodies. Um, so his areas of specialism include both commercial and residential property, in particular in relation to local government law. Uh, conveyancing issues, development, land, commercial property, and encumbrances in relation to, to land. Um, and as part of Law 2023 Online, Richard's sessions uh, include commercial leases update uh, and exercising break clauses and other methods of terminating commercial leases. So that's, that's who we are. Richard, go oh, ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I wish I'd been um, head of professional support since 2022. It was actually 2002. Uh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> 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 Made me feel young, though, you know. There you go. Well, we'll begin with a um, with, with a slight typo and uh, <laughs> and hope to improve from there. So, uh, okay, so that's who we are. That's what we've um, that's what our sessions have, have been about, and we have some pre-submitted questions. Um, so let's let's embark on those. And the first one of those uh, is for you, Richard. Can a landlord upgrade a lease on a renewal and include green lease clauses? Oh, it's quite fashionable, though. It's one of those things that people have been asking me about suddenly this year. I'm sure you've come across them as well, these green lease clauses, which at their worst are basically landlords trying to pass liability for what they should be doing you know, to the tenants. Uh, you know, you've got to do an energy audit, you've got to do an UEPC and all these kind of things, and you, know, you have to do any works to make it up to standards. Yeah. Which, uh, frankly, if you're talking about a 25-year lease, fine. You know, the tenant stands to be a winner in terms of reduced energy bills and all these things. But when you start seeing them foisted on tenants on five-year, 54-act excluded leases, it's a bit of a problem. Sure. And obviously, on the grant of the lease itself, uh, then it depends on who needs who the most. We have had a few court, county court decisions which are not precedents on 54-act renewals. I know it's something I've talked about in the past when I've done sort of 54 Landlord and Tenant Act uh, courses for this listers group. Uh, the starting point, in theory at least, if not always in practice, uh, to change the terms on the lease, of a lease on the renewal, any of the terms, outside duration and the premises and the rent, is Section 35 of the Act, which says you're supposed to have regard to the terms of the current tenancy. And the classic case, O'Mayan City of London Real Property Company, a House of Lords case from 1983, said that uh, you know, the person wishing to change the terms on the renewal, it's their burden and it's a strong burden. It's got to be just and equitable between the parties. Um, there's been a couple of cases, these are cases I suspect have been referred to, which are in my notes, which I mentioned. One was uh, Clipper Logistics. Uh, and the other was the um, W.H. Smith's case, um, mm. Commerce Real Investment Gesellschaft. I've said that so many times this last two and a bit years <laughs> that I, I can actually pronounce it now. Uh, and uh, both occasions on a renewal, especially in the W.H. Smith case, the landlords wish to introduce what you might call green lease clauses. 
uh, you know, the tenants will be responsible for any new EPC, for an energy audit, and for any work that needed to be done under the energy audit. And uh, the court uh, refused to accept it. The club, club logistics, I don't know if you've come across it in your talks, actually, because that was more about um, you know, sort of yielding up in the same, you know, with the same level of EPC and not doing any works that uh, on the premises, which would sort of reduce the energy efficiency levels. And the courts basically said, again, you can't change the terms on the renewal, but you, know, you probably didn't need to in that occasion anyway. So as it stands at the moment in the county courts, then you might have a chance of objecting on a 54 hour renewal. I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I mean, the, the, the Clipper Logistics case is not one that I've covered in my in my talks. I mean, um, I, I, I just sort of, uh, uh, it, it's a sort of speculation, really. But, you know, we've got the Law Commission promising as a consultation on the 1954 Act towards, uh, it's coming out towards the end of this year. Yeah. And um, uh, we will see how... Uh, how radical they're prepared to be i suspect not very um but um it might be interesting i, I just kind of thought you know if you it, 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 thought in my mind is if you're talking about um reducing burdens on business and um uh, just making it quicker and easier to get lease renewals dealt with then um, at least for low value short term leases it might be um an opportunity to think about imposing forms of leases and um, whether they would include any include uh, any sort of green lease clauses. You know, but I mean, I, I suspect that the law commission is not going to be that radical. Um, but I, um, I, I think the law commission. We, we talked about, about about this before. I remember, the law commission has been talking about reforming the Fifty Four Act probably since about nineteen fifty four. Quite honestly, <laughs> has you know, a long time. Is, you know, they, they've been talking about it and nothing ever happens. I mean. Again, I remember talking to you about it before. In this day and age, you've got to ask whether we really need a 54 landlord and tenant. That's a completely different sort of market than it was uh, when, well, the previous, well, there was predecessors, the 54 Act just after the Second World War. Yeah. Completely different market. So we'll have to see what happens with that. But I suspect in, until I retire, I'll be doing courses on the 54 Act still. <laughs> yes, long may it last. Um, so. Um... Uh, okay, thank you. So, so the next question is is uh, one for me. You mentioned offer back provisions. Indeed, I did. Um, is isn't there a case that says they don't work? Um, sort of. Um, so, um, and you know, well remembered. But um, uh, the, the the point of offer back provisions in the context of um, uh, alienation consents, assignment and subletting and so forth, um, is of course to give the landlord sort of ultimate control, like a nuclear option. You know, if the um, tenant wants to assign the lease or wants to sublet sometimes, then they've got to first of all offer to the landlord to surrender the lease and, you know, the landlord accepts and the landlord in theory at least can, you know, take the property back and relet on the terms that they want to let and to the people they want to let to rather than um, be stuck with um, an, a, an unwelcome assignment or an unwelcome subletting. Um, so that's the idea. Now, um, the, the, the case which uh, I think the question has in mind is all that London properties in Newton, which I think also goes back to 1983. Um, and that, of course, is on the old um, court-based contracting out procedure, um, which, of course, we haven't um, had to deal with for almost 20 years so uh, perhaps some of those um, on this um, zoom recording won't be familiar with it but um, uh, the, the, the old the old system was of course one had to get the court's approval to uh, contract out a lease and, and and indeed to an agreement to surrender a lease um, so uh, the, the, the conclusion there was that having that clause in the lease the offer back clause was not itself a surrender agreement which required contracting out um, as and when the tenant made its offer to surrender the lease and the landlord accepted it, at that point, you would have a surrender agreement. And to be enforceable, it would have to have been contracted out. And by that point, it was too late um, because uh, the contracting out process should have been gone through prior to that agreement being entered into. And no way you could have that done before the lease was granted because that contracting out process had to be gone through between the people who are the landlord and the tenant. So a bit of a catch-22. You, you ended up with an unenforceable surrender agreement um, and a bit of an unsatisfactory sort of stalemate. Um, it, it, it is possible um, that the same sort of problem arises in relation to you know, the current notice and declaration procedure. Um, and um, 
I mean, there is uh, some suggestion that um, you know, with with the current procedure, it's possible to have a workable process. So if you structure things in the way that if the tenant wants to assign the lease, um, then they first of all have to um, give the landlord a non-binding notice indicating their intention to serve the offer back notice. The landlord can then and presumably will respond with the warning notice for the contracting out process. Um, the tenant then cannot serve the offer back notice until they've returned the relevant declaration. Um, at which point, you know, they make the offer back notice, the landlord says yes, and then you should have a duly authorised um, offer, a duly authorised surrender agreement. That's the theory, never, of course, been tested in, in any court case. Um, you don't see it that often, in my experience, in, um, in, in lease documentation, but some people think it's worth a go. Um, and uh, maybe that's a route around the problem. Of course, the other route around the problem is to contract the lease out in the first place. Um, and one tends to see offer back provisions in, in things like turnover rent based leases, um, where landlords are very sensitive about having an assignment to um, some tenant with a different business profile, different profit margins, where the turnover percentage may not be appropriate. Um, and, you know, they may like to have the, um, the option of an offer back arrangement in those circumstances and turnover rent leases for that and other reasons. Um, are uh, almost always contracted out of the 1954 Act. Um, so yes, there is a case that throws a bit of doubt on offer back provisions, but uh, again, there may be uh, appropriate ways around that sort of um, that sort of problem. I think that's uh, I think yeah. that covers it. Unless you have anything to add on that one, Richard. No, I'm just <coughs> reminding me that uh, the 54 Act reforms and the warning notices are almost 20 years old next year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I did a course, there's nothing to do with commercial leases and the likes, but I did a course not so long ago. I was mentioning STLT and how it came in in December 2003. And so a woman at the course sort of um, said that she thought that STLT had been around forever. Didn't realise it came in the late 2003. And I said, no, it came in December 2003. And she said, uh, how would I know that? I was only three at the time. <laughs> and this just made me feel sick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're going to have offer backs, I think you just, you know, the easiest way of dealing with all that is that, um, is just to exclude the 54 Act. Yeah, yeah. From the beginning. Yeah. And I, I've, I've seen it argued that, um, even with the contracted out lease, you still need to contract out a surrender agreement as well. But that is not my view, and I don't think that's the consensus view. Anyway, I think you can get a bit go a bit too far as to what you'd have to do. Yeah. I'm amazed the 54 Act warning notices have not been <clears throat> particularly litigated. We've had two court of appeal cases now, <clears throat> uh, but uh, I'm amazed they're not being particularly litigated since they came in in 2004. Because I remember at the time thinking that there's so many things left unsaid yes. with notices. And I was expecting huge amounts of litigation, but it's not really material. We had the TFS uh, stores case um, and uh, Chilton Railways and Patel back in 2008. And that's basically it, as far as I can remember. You more or less think. I mean, I, I remember, um, um, you know, I was a professional support lawyer and and uh, so were you at the time when, when, the, when the process came in. And, you know, there was a lot of kind of, discussion about what the problems might be and I, I, remember, I remember putting together the firm's internal guidance on to how to, on your bits of best practice for operating the contracting out process and this incredibly simple notice and declaration process generated about 24 pages of guidance you know it's it really as you say so many unanswered questions and um many of them still remain unanswered yeah all right it's a shame yeah. that the tfs scores which i kept in my notes actually although it's yeah. court of appeal heard it over two years ago now yeah. Uh, and um, in design and retail outlet centres, it's a shame that uh, the Supreme Court refused leave to appeal that case because we might have had something pretty concrete. Uh, yeah. So things like the term commencement date and who just served the notice and who signed the declarations and the likes. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, well um, OK, so so moving on. Next question. And this is one for you. On the Valley View and NHS case, there's a lengthy judgment to, uh, to get one's <laughs> teeth into. Uh, is Valley View and NHS a reliable decision, is the question. <clears throat> Got the answer? No. <laughs> uh, but uh, I did a podcast on this when it, you know, last, it was last year, when it was new. Um, and like you say, it, 
it's not one unless you can't sleep at night, then you know, it's not one to plod through the whole of the decision. Yeah. And I suppose they were dealing with well, it was four different medical practices, but it was a test case for about three thousand doctors' practices up and down the country. And it's this case that uh, dealt with tenancies at will. When the um, amongst other things, it was mainly about uh, service charge liability. You know, could the NHS property services, the immediate landlord, pass their service charge liability you know, for the boiler system onto onto Valley View medical practice? Uh, but they also, and and uh, in that particular case, dealt with the sort of tenancies at will point because the tenancy at will doesn't come within the fifty four Landlord and Tenant Act was settled as long ago as nineteen fifty six, a case called Wheeler and Mercer. Um, a lot of people, I mean. Basically, they've been there under verbal, you know, sort of with no written lease whatsoever for about 15 years in Valley View. And it doesn't seem to be the case that they've been negotiating at all for the first four years. They were paying the rental and the likes and not much more. And then half heartedly negotiating over about 10 or 11 years. Um, contrary to popular belief, there are cases, quite clear cases. Jarvin and Akeel was the first in 1991, a court of appeal case that said, it might be high risk, but you can pay rent in advance under a tenancy at will as long as you're sort of heading towards, you know, it's understood from both sides that you're negotiating the final lease, but no negotiations, no tenancy at will. Uh, I personally can't see after 15 years with practically no negotiations whatsoever for the first four years, it can be a tenancy at will. So I don't think it's reliable. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Um I think that, that that's really, you know, the interesting, well, one of the interesting points about the case is is um, the idea that, um, which I can sort of see, that the, the tenancy at will is a sort of interim arrangement, and as long as the parties have in mind negotiating something more formal eventually, um, that in the meantime they're, they're um, occupying on a, on, a, on a tenancy at will. Um, but um, it... It is, I think, when there's when there, when there has been no negotiation, um, and simply are relying on the, upon the fact that both parties intend at some point to have a more formal arrangement, but haven't negotiated. I think it's it's pushing the envelope a lot, at least. Um, and there was that um, now. What was that case um, a couple of years back about the Eremus yeah. Eremus Housing Trust and yeah, um, where it was, it was a much more kind of typical case, I think, really where there had been negotiations and they'd petered out and nothing had been said for, I think, three years. Mm. Um, uh, and the judges fudged it and said, oh, yeah, negotiations may have been, you know, sporadic and desultory, but uh, they'd not actually terminated. Um, therefore, nothing had happened to what began as a tenancy at will, as everyone agreed, carried on as a tenancy at will. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, however unlikely it might be, um, that you could stop that being a tenancy at will by simply announcing to the other side, right, we're not negotiating anymore. Um, and that would sort of formally end negotiations, and then you must have something else as the basis of occupation. Well, I, yeah. I, I think, I mean, Aramis, I mean, they had a 54 Act excluded lease beforehand, and it was you know, negotiating a new lease. Now, yeah. What surprised me about Aramis is I can understand it was, you know, I think, you know, the tenants basically announced that's it, we're out after about, I think it was, two and a half years or something. Um, and I can understand how that might be a tenancy at will. You know, you've been negotiating. I didn't understand. They got as far as heads of terms, which surprised me a bit, Naramis. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually mentioned in my notes, but I don't think I talked about it on the um, on the Zoom uh, and the, in the, the webinar. Uh, they, um, the case that was, one of the other cases that, that was heard together with the Valley View, an HS property services case, was... Uh, where called St. Andrew's Medical Centre and NHS uh, Property Services, which was in somewhere in Salford, some medical practice in Salford. And in that particular case, um, they'd originally had a 15-year lease that had come to an end, and they were sort of half-hearted, or well, they were negotiating for two and a half years, the new lease. Uh, negotiations broke down temporarily because they were arguing about service charge liability. Then they started again. I, I can quite clearly accept that that's a tenancy at will. But not for 15 years and four years with no negotiations whatsoever. I find that very difficult yeah. to believe. And also what they went on to say is that it might be a tenancy at will, but you can still imply a liability, a term in relation to service charge. The landlord can pass their liability onto the 
you know, lieutenant. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a question that I get asked every now and again, and probably you do too, which is, you know, uh, how long does a tenancy will go go on before it turns into a periodic tenancy or, or, or something or something more harder, you know? Um, and I suppose on the basis of, you know, cases like Erimus and the Valley View case, the answer is, well, pretty much indefinitely, you know, um, whether that's realistic or not, you know, um, but, um, but but that does seem to be what the case is saying at any rate. Um, if I wanted to, if it yeah. was, if I was negotiating at the end of a, you know, the, the new lease, especially if it's 54 Act excluded, you know, I, you know, I'd want a tenancy will for a short period, yeah. regardless of value view, and I expressly create a tenancy at will. I wouldn't leave it to you know some implication of renegotiation. I'd want an express tenancy at will, yeah. and. Yeah. Uh, I say I, I think that case is a way of getting people off the hook when they've already made the mistake, if you like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you also get situations. You know, I, I, I know um, I won't um, name names, but you can probably guess. But a, a, a very large and prominent department store in Birmingham City Centre, um, when that was developed, it was a sort of open secret that um, yeah uh, they were occupying on an agreement for lease for about seven years, and the agreement for lease said that during that time they were occupying as tenant at will. That really, <laughs> the amount of rent they've been paying, the amount of money they spent fitting the place out, is a court. If it ever came to it, would a court really hold that was a tenancy at will? I just but doubt that. I think the judge in Valley yeah. View might, but I don't think <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've also, I mean, I've had so many questions through over the years about either, you know, you know, the, the landlord wants the um, the lease contracted out the Fifty Four Act, and you find that the tenant's been there for the last year trading. Uh, no, it's too late to serve the. Is it too late to serve the warning notices? What's their status now? Or you know, the lease, the Fifty Four Act excluded lease came to an end three years ago, and the tenants just remain put. Yeah. And if there's been negotiations going on, you can argue it's a tenancy at will. But if there's no negotiations, it's just being forgotten. That's not a tenancy at will. Yeah. I just also very briefly before we leave Valley View, that I think the other point of interest there is that. Um, you don't get that many cases that give you much guidance as to how a court goes about deciding what are the terms of an implied tenancy. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll probably be quite a useful, although lengthy, quite a useful kind of starting point for anybody trying to answer those kind of questions in future. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so yeah, moving on. Uh, and this is one for me. Uh, if a landlord unreasonably delays dealing with an application for consent, uh, I suppose therefore we're talking about an application for consent to a sign or sublet, um, and the tenant successfully claims damages, what would the measure of damages be? Um, uh, lawyer's answer depends on the circumstances. Um, more sensible answer, I suppose. Um, yeah, the the assumption is the deal goes off, you know, the assignee or the subtenant walks away, um, which means the tenant has ongoing rental liability, which they didn't otherwise expect to have. Um, so, so that's going to be um, an element of, of of damages, but I suppose subject to the consideration that had the deal gone through, the tenant would probably have gone away and moved into other premises and would have incurred some rental liability there. So you'd have to give credit for um, you know the amount they would have paid on on other other premises, um, and of course there's you know lost transaction costs as well. Um, there may be other things that um, you know that would that would arise out of the specific circumstances. Um, one of the things that I always think is, is sort of interesting, well, it's a speculation. I mean, you can't point to any case where this has happened unless you can, but, um, you know, it, let, let's say um, an application is made to a landlord um, for consent to a sign, and the landlord takes a long time dealing with it, and they eventually um, say yes on, let's say, the 10th of July. Um, and the conclusion of the court in the end is that a reasonable landlord would have said yes on the 10th of June, a month beforehand. Um, well, now you've got a case where the landlord has granted consent, the deal has not been lost, it's gone ahead, but you've got a tenant who can potentially still say, well, look, I've incurred an extra quarter's rent because the June quarter day fell between the date when you should have said yes and the date when you actually did say yes. I mean, actually did say yes. I don't think it's beyond the bounds of possibility you could sustain a claim for damages even where the landlord eventually says yes if they've unreasonably withheld dealing with the, the application. Um, but as I say, I'm not aware of any case in which that's actually happened. Um, but um, but there it is. Um, so, so a fairly short answer, I think, really, uh, uh, unless you have anything to uh, 
to ship in. There was that case some years ago. Um, was on, and I can remember it was on Fulham Road in London, but I can't. It was design prospects oh, and Thurlow, was it? Design progression and Thurlow, yeah, yeah. Which said that you could claim exemplary damages. Yes. Your set of flags. Yeah, absolutely. And um, calculated to make a profit um, by, you know, sort of delaying or not giving consent to the assignment. And the, 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 yeah. the other one, which I did a podcast on, pushing my podcast today, uh, but uh, was, you come across that residential one of uh, Gavin Farrakhan. Farrakhan. Oh, that's a very interesting one, yeah. You know, yeah. It, was a, it was a bit of a, it was in the, in, in the press and the likes, mm. where it was, um, it was a long lease um, yeah. in, in London again, Kensington Park Road, where the landlord had basically instructed his agents, you know, make life hard for the tenant because the tenants uh, had objected to the landlord, wanted to, he had commercial premises down below a shop and had objected to the fact he wanted to, you know, sort of open throughout the night and sell alcohol and the likes. Yeah, yeah. And so the landlord sort of made life deliberately hard for the tenant, rejected two purchasers, you know, these long, these are nine, whatever, long leases, I forget what duration. Uh, and the third purchaser uh, paid a lot less money by way of premium and they got that damages, but the court in that case said there was no evidence of exemplary damages. The landlord hadn't calculated to make a profit. He just hated the tenant, basically. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I always remember another case from about 10 years ago, a case called Singh and Danby, which was a mm-hmm. dental practice. Do you remember that one? I, I did, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. They got something like, uh, you know, strange one where, again, the landlord and tenant took, seemed to have hated one another and culminated in the landlord going to re-enter the premises, you know, when the tenant wasn't there and going into... Uh, Bodily affected forfeiture when the tenant didn't pay the rent because the landlord had changed his bank account and not told the tenant. Yeah. And then yeah. the tenant wants to be out and the landlord seems desperate to keep them. And I don't know if it says something about how much dental practices make, but they got £183,000 plus 31000 quid interest on that one, mm. Mm. which I think a lot of people will be quite surprised at that level of damages. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, um, clients are rightly landlord clients are rightly concerned about the exposure to damages um and um yeah i mean obviously exemplary damages as you say i mean that that's an extra exposure it, I, I think there's i think there is still only that case design progression and I certainly. Certainly. um but i, I know see, oh, sorry i was going to say one of the one of the judges mr justice peter smith was having a bit of a campaign against um those two companies mount cook land and mount eden land who seem to sort of ha- make a hobby out of unreasonably refusing applications for consent and the law reports are just full of cases with mount cookland and mount Eden. Yeah. um mm-hmm. and i think they were on the verge of having exemplary damages awarded against them a couple of times but um but never but uh, never actually happened um but no man, i think i think you know you've you got to take the threat of a damages claim seriously in the, these mm-hmm. circumstances yeah. i think people have thrown in you know They've tried to claim exemplary damages. You know, if you're going to claim damages, why not claim exemplary as well? But that's the only case I've come across where they actually succeeded. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, next question, and this is one for you. Um, what is the difference between giving up occupation and giving up vacant possession? I think this is something we talked about in the past. Um, we might uh, well have done, yeah. Yeah. I mean, vacant possession, you know, it's... Um, it's like, um, Basically, it's where you've got to you know, substantially be able to, you know, if the landlord can you know, purchase for that matter, can't substantially occupy a substantial part of the premises, you haven't given up vacant possession. And uh, I suspect it's the, you know, sort of, it's one of the cases I, I discussed the, um, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, um, in the course. Uh, you know, you've got to basically vacate or, or substantially vacate the premises. Giving up occupation is, is, a lesser obligation, if you like, um, that uh, if you, you know, you've given up occupation, if you're, you know, you stopped running your business, your staff are no longer there and so on. And it's a much easier thing for, for the tenants to do than vacant possession. And I think if I was a leaseholder at the moment, I'd, uh, I'd want, you know, as a condition precedent for exercising breaks, I'd, I'd want to give up occupation as opposed to vacant possession. Yeah, I think in, in 
practical terms, the difference is often things like demountable partitioning left behind and um, you know wiring and cabling left behind and stuff of that sort, isn't it? Or, yeah. or, or chattels here and there. Um, and, and the um, I know you know in, in so far as anyone pays attention to it, the the you know the lease code in its latest iteration um, you know, says as it has done for ages that um, in terms of conditions upon break options um rather than in having a condition for giving vacant possession it should be a condition that the tenant has gone out of occupation and left behind no um sub tenants or other occupiers sure. which obviously is an awful lot easier to establish um and and and, and to satisfy um so it, i mean it is quite a difference isn't it and there's um and there's a funny case the you know the capital capital like radio case, case in leeds capital. yeah yeah Park and Global Radio, which is yep, that's one. Yeah. the case in the notes that I was talking about, because it's I think it's quite a significant case. I mean, it would have been diff it would have been much in more interesting if the Court of Appeal had decided the same way as the High Court decided, because mm -hmm. they tried to argue in that case that the tenant's not given up vacant possession because not he's left things behind, he's taken things with them that they shouldn't have taken. Yeah. You know, they halfway through the dilapidations, you know, uh work. Uh, when the lease came to an end, and they'd taken half the roof and windows and you know electrical wiring behind. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah. Uh, the court said, "You've st you know, uh, vacant possession means leaving things behind. It doesn't mean things take you know taking things with you that you shouldn't. Yeah. And if they take things with them that they shouldn't, your remedy against them now is is claim and damages, separate claim and damages. But they could still yeah. you know, sort of um, they could still um, you know." comply with the condition precedent. But like you yeah. said, I think, you know, the code for leasing business premises uh, says that the conditions precedent you should include, it's only a code of practice. Yeah. Uh, some people think, I'm, I've come across surveyors thinking it's law, <laughs> but uh, yeah. they, um, yeah. the basic rent has to be paid, you give up occupation and any subleases come to an end. And I think that's a good yeah. compromise. Yeah, and That tends um, to be the one you see more, more than vacant possession nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I might just bring forward one of the questions um, that's a bit further down our list, actually, which which is sort of linked, which is, um, as a tenant, should I resist conditions precedent as to exercising break clauses? Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> tenant, I think you should. I mean, they, I, I, I think we've probably answered it, actually. If I was a tenant, I'd want no conditions precedent. I'd want a clean break. You know, you're bound to. Um, sometimes I have seen landlords accept that. Um, you know, I, I don't do as much nowadays, but in the past I've done work for, you know, quite a lot of central government bodies still do a bit. And uh, people like the Ministry of Defence, Defence Estates as they were. And, you know, what, do you really need conditions precedent for exercising breaks there? You know, you can always sue them for antecedent breaches anyway. Yeah. And they might take their time, but they're usually worth suing. Yeah. I, I used to be well, it always used to amuse me when people on the other side used to want the people like the Ministry of Defence to find guarantors for them. Yes. <laughs> if, if they go bust, we're all seriously in trouble. Um, but yeah. uh, well, we're all guarantors, aren't we? For the... <laughs> but but the, um, yeah. they, I, I think the compromise is what the Code for Leasing Business Premises says, and I've still still seen it. Absolutely amazes me. Do you remember that Sahawi case, Sahawi Investments and Henderson? Yeah, yeah. Is that, yeah. Where they basically, you know, if you breach the terms of the lease, you can't break the lease. Mm. And they had one picket, you know, wooden fence that uh, was uh, about 100 quid's worth of work on it. And they'd left yeah. it in a state of disrepair. They were actually arguing that the landlord had uh, seen to the picket fence uh, being damaged himself after they'd left. And they didn't succeed on that. Well, one, the thing you can't accept is an absolute condition. You must comply with the terms of the lease. And I certainly wouldn't accept, and you don't see it that often as you used to, the sort of, you know, you must reasonably comply or materially comply or substantially comply, because that's just asking for litigation. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you can go back to um, Finch and Underwood. That's back in the, well, back in the 19th century sometime. I think 1870s-ish. Uh, and... Um, uh, and, and the court said there that, you know, as long as the tenants made a reasonable attempt to comply with their, uh, or an honest attempt to comply with their covenants, um, then they shouldn't be tripped up by you know, trivial or minor things. But they always are. <laughs> they always are. And the courts always kind of trot out Finch and Underwood, but tenants always get tripped up on minor stuff. 
Um, and, and I think actually, you know, really, it's a respectable kind of argument to say, well, look, I'm giving you a valuable property right, the right to bring your lease to an end ahead of time. The least I should expect is to get the property back in a state where I can relet it. I don't think that's an um, unreasonable sort of approach. What's unreasonable is the way the courts have interpreted these conditions and, and um, uh, you know, and, and been so strict about it. But that is clearly the law. That is clearly what the, the courts are going to do. Um, and uh, so the lease code obviously says goes out its way to say you shouldn't have any conditionality upon physical condition of the premises. Um, and you've got your remedies for that, as you're saying, just deal with it like any normal lease termination. Well, the um, worst of all was that Avocet and Morel case. Mm -hmm. you remember that one? Which, um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they didn't take to appeal and they settled it mm -hmm. where they had to pay you know, any monetary payments owed to the landlord. And over the previous five years, the tenant had been late on occasion with payment of the rent. And they also had to pay interest. They paid all the rent, but they still owed 130 quid of interest. Yeah. And yeah. the court decided they can't break the lease. And that's just not the real world, really. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the other one, you remember Osborne Assets in Britannia Life mm -hmm. back in the 80s? You know, the, 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 the classic case where the break was defeated by the tenant having decorated with two coats of paint and the lease required three. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go. Um, okay, um, so moving on, and one for me is the landlord entitled to require any information on the financial standing of a prospective subtenant? Um, depends on circumstances, you know, and generally, no, um, for the obvious reason that the um, uh, you know, the, the, the tenant remains tenant, you've got the financial covenant which you always had, um. So, yeah, it, um, it, it's an uphill struggle to try to object to a subletting because of the financial states of the, of the, of the subtenant. But I would say not always. I mean, you know, if, um, uh, the, if there's no requirement in the head lease that a sublease be contracted out of the 1954 Act, you know, if the subtenant, uh, if, if, you know, if the tenant is granting this sublease, not too far away from the contractual expiry date. So it comes to renewal, the subtenant will renew, they'll end up in a direct contractual relationship with the landlord, then yeah, I would have thought this is a perfectly legitimate for a landlord to be concerned about the, the covenant strength of the, of the subtenant in those cases. Um, so yeah, generally no, but um, you know, circumstances might arise that justify a concern about the uh, financial standing of the subtenant, I think. Um, so uh, that, I think that, Another fairly short answer, but um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree entirely. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I mean, one of my favourite cases in the whole of commercial leases was that um, late nineties case, Footwear and Amplite. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, granting a sublease to somebody who was going to run a pet shop in, was in Wimbledon, I think, yeah. uh, and uh, not least of which, I mean, because they refused consent to uh, to the subletting on the grounds, well, that the pets the pets would be noisy and, you know, unsuitable for the area. And the judge described how these pets wouldn't be noisy because only 2% of the trade involves selling live animals, which has always suggested to me that 98% of the trade involves selling <laughs> dead animals. Uh, but uh, I'm sure they didn't mean that. Uh, but um, they said in that case, you can't have a, you know, blanket profits must be three times the rental for subleases mm -hmm. because of the reasons you said, Mark. Yeah. Um, I think also, I mean, same with assignment to some extent. The fact that, you know, you can have absolute conditions of assignment or you can sort of, you know, if you start getting a bit too clever, you're just going to reduce rental anyway. Yeah. You reduce the number of people who might be interested in taking on that property. Absolutely. And, you know, financial tests anyway, they're, they're all, it's just a snapshot, isn't it? It's just a snapshot of the financial position at, at one time on what may be slightly out-of-date information. So this is not very satisfactory, really. Um, uh, yeah, okay. I think I'll as, as you brought one of yours forward, I'll bring one of mine forward. And, um, so another one here. Um, uh, sometimes tenants make informal approaches to sound the landlord out and only make a formal request for consent to assign later. Um, does the reasonable time for dealing with the application run from the informal approach or the formal request? Um, which is a tricky one, actually, and I, I agree. That's something that crops up in practice. You know, you get um, a sort of sounding out letter saying, you know, would you, um, in principle, have a problem with, you know, the lease being assigned to, a, you know, 
computer games retailer or a games arcade or something of that sort, you know. Um, uh, and it may be fairly obvious who the tenant's planning to assign to. And you can look at it, well, are they making an application for consent or are they not making an application for consent? Um, with, you know, that practical implication that time runs against the landlord if it is a formal application for, for consent. Um, and I suppose, you know, the obvious thing to do is isn't, it isn't always possible to tell. And the obvious thing to do is, is, is to just write back saying, look, are you formally applying for consent or not? Um, there again, if a landlord thinks it's going to get drawn out and contentious, then there may be a value in delaying asking that question and giving yourself a bit more time to have the arguments and to um, and see if one can overcome any 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 problems or develop the objections that you want to make. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, it, an informal approach may, I suppose, you know, it, it, when com one comes to interpret the correspondence, be held to be an actual application for consent. Although, you know, then again, there's issues about um, complying with formalities of service. And, you know, the 1988 Act um, requires that the, uh, well, according to a case of uh, E.ON and Giles Sports, uh, uh, requires that an application be served in accordance with the service provisions of the lease. Um, not a decision that I agree with, actually. Um, and actually, I, I think it was just, it was certainly not followed in that case we mentioned earlier on, Gabon for Oxford. Um, but anyway, it, it's there as an argument, and that may mean that an informal approach can't be um, a, 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 a an application for consent but um yeah it, it's a risk and i think it's worth clarifying if um if one isn't in, if one's in a bit of doubt about that sort of thing yeah i think that's right i mean you, i just wanted some clarification from the leaseholder if it was sort of vague terms like that because it, it could depend not that most of them get to litigation but if they ever got to litigation it, it would be one of those things you'd be able to decide with the benefit of hindsight yeah uh, so I'd want some formal clarification from the tenants if it wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, this is um, another one for you then. Can, uh, can heads of terms? I see what this is driving at. Can heads of terms ever give rise to a legally binding contract? Well, according to the case that I'm sure they're sort of referring to in my update, um, the Pretoria Energy blank the estates case. Uh, it wasn't on the facts, but it could be a legally binding contract. You know, obviously, contracts in relation to land, a few exceptions like leases for three or less years in duration, have to comply with Section 2 of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act. They have to be in writing and contain all the express terms and being signed. Uh, in that case, uh, well, the Court of Appeal decided on slightly different grounds than the High Court, but it was the same decision, that uh, heads of terms could have been a slightly different set of facts, a legally binding contract. The heads of terms have been signed. They contained all the express terms. Uh, it was held that they weren't because um, there was an exclusivity agreement. You, you, know, you had to negotiate with one another for X number of months and nobody else. And also the heads of terms said the lease was going to be excluded from the 54 Act. And as we mentioned previously, it's too late to exclude if you already got the agreement, the contract. Um but on a slightly different set of facts, it could be. Sometimes you might even intend it to be. There's cases going back to the 19th century that deal with it. Um, and why on earth, they, if you did want to leave it beyond doubt, you just don't use the word subject to contract. I think they said this was a the proposed agreement in mm. Victoria Energy. But yeah. uh, just leave it beyond doubt. Make it clear. Yeah. That's the other thing is that you don't have to have what you and I think of as a signature. Uh, in the case, of, it was a case called Neoclios or Neoclios or something in Greece. Greece, that's right. It was about yeah. selling a piece of land that was necessary for access uh, somewhere in the Lake District, about 2018. Yeah. Uh, when they, um, they decided that uh, a stream of emails between the two solicitors gave rise to a legally binding contract complying with Section 2, mm -hmm. and the signature was the plotter which said your name, your profession, and who you work for. Yeah, yeah. It's quite frightening. It is, and, and I, I think a lot of those cases where people end up being bound by things they didn't expect to be bound by is layman documenting things. But I mean, that was a case of solicitors That's documenting things. Uh, mm -hmm. And as you say, why not use the word subject to contract? But, um, but that's sort of the interesting thing, I think, about the Pretoria case is the discussion about the... Um, interpretation point so it's just a good reminder of basic principles that you know you don't have to have the word subject to contract for it 
not to be a binding agreement. You know, it, it, it can still be, you know, the language of the agreement. You say that I think that the the, the document was headed to heads of terms for a proposed agreement, which is pretty clear. Um, it doesn't have to use the, the, the magic words subject to contract. Um, and equally, you know, as, as, as um, I think the first instance judge said, you know, um, heads of terms, well, you know, sometimes businessmen record even valuable and important deals in a very summary sort of way. And, you know, they may call it a heads of terms, you know, but it may be a binding contract. Um, so, um, you know, it'd be nice if we had a sort of simple, straightforward um, rule, but we don't. It's just, you know, it's down to interpretation in any, any, any particular case, isn't it? I think we're going to have a lot of cases going forward on emails giving rise to legally binding contracts. Yeah. Especially on short leases, you know, where you don't have to comply with Section 2. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think we, we haven't heard the last of those kind of things. No. I, I don't know if you saw, there was a case Hudson and Hathaway in the past yeah. past, past couple of months. Um, again, lay people negotiating by email about um, the fate of the former mar matrimonial home. And... Um, the key thing was an email from the former male partner saying, oh, I have no interest whatsoever in the house, signed Lee. I mean, we just I, typed, typed regard them. Lee, that was it. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, that gave rise to, uh, well, it wasn't Section 2, but it was um, Section 53 of the, the Law of Property Act. Yeah. Uh, Act. That was a disposal of his equitable interest, his beneficial interest. Yeah. In yeah. So never send emails to former partners <laughs> and <laughs> things true. like that. That's, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. the message there. It's quite, I find that quite amazing, kind of regards, Lee. I know, I know. And also, you know, actually, just the, the, you know, the words, I have no interest whatsoever in the property, that's a bit ambiguous, isn't it? I mean, you know, does it mean I have no beneficial interest, or does it mean, you know, I don't, I don't care what you do with it? Oh, it, you it know? Went off a, a tangent. Yeah. In that case, yeah. they, they were, well, he basically said that I'll forego, uh, you know, an interest in the property, you can have the house if you don't claim against my savings or my pension. Yeah. And she, she, they were cohabiting. They, she didn't have an interest in the savings or pension anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, unlike married couples, but that's uh, another strange one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, here's, here's one for me. Uh, you often get tricky issues at lease expiry about things like tenants fixtures, don't you just? Um, how would you deal with that in the license to sign to make life easier at, at lease end? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the answer to that is specificity, you know, and, and, um, anticipate the issues that are going to come up. And, you know, um, it's amazing, you know, when you talk about dilapidations claims in training courses, as I do, and I'm sure you do that, you know, you, you always sort of end up talking about major items like the roof and the foundations and the lift and stuff like that. If it's an office premises, yeah, nine times out of ten, it's all about carpets and partitions and ceiling tiles, uh, and um, you know, which all sort of interact with each other in a kind of physical sort of way. Uh, and um, I mean, carpet's a great example. You know, if, if carpet is, if it's carpet tiles glued down to the floor, it's probably going to be a fixture. Um, if it's a broad limb carpet with just carpet grippers around the edge of the room, then it may well be a tenant's fixture because it's dead easy to take it up and reuse it somewhere else. If it's just a loose carpet, just a big rug that isn't attached to anything, well, then, of course, it's a chattel. Again, you, you, you can pick it up and take it away. So everything's very sort of fact-dependent. Um, and when you start arguing about things like tenant's fixtures, um, well, I mean, first of all, as regards fixtures, you know, we have these kind of slightly bizarre tests about the um, uh, not only the degree of annexation, you know, how permanent something's fixed, but the purpose of annexation. The sort of rather opaque test of, you know, is the item attached for the better enjoyment of the premises or the better enjoyment of the item? Well, that's, you know, that's a conundrum. Um, and with tenants' fixtures, all the issues about is it there for the tenants' trade or for ornament and convenience? And um, can it be uh, taken out without damaging the property or losing its essential utility? Why bother? You know, let's have it in the license to assign. Let's put it. Let's let's put it down there. And um, I had um, on a, on a course, a delegate said to me, um, he was a surveyor, and he said they'd been involved in a, a lease granted to fir a firm of solicitors. Um, and when it came to the solicitors' fit out, you know, the surveyors just thought this was hilarious and just lawyers being nitpicking. They produced this kind of specification of work, what we're going to do, and it's like in tabular format. And uh, with every item on the specification, they had columns 
for comments on various aspects as to what the legal consequences were going to be when it got to the end of the term. Um, and so it's a very tedious exercise, sort of filling this out. And they thought it was ridiculous. And then when they got to the end of the lease, there were no arguments. Everything was everything was clear, you know. And I love it. You know, if I'm dealing with a schedule of dilapidations um, uh, and I look in the lease and there's a clause saying the tenant will recarpet in the last six months of the term, well, then yippee, you know, I'm delighted. You don't have any kind of issue about that sort of stuff. Um, but it seems to me, you know, if you were going to, you don't have to do things in a tabular format, but I mean, really, you know, if it, I think there are maybe four questions that you need to ask yourself and to answer ideally in the documentation, which is, you know, is this item um, something which is going to be valued, you mean rentalized on rent review or lease renewal? Uh, will the repairing obligations in the lease apply to it? Um, is it something where the landlord is going to be able to require reinstatement? Is it something which the tenant's going to be entitled to take away at a lease expiry? You know, provide for those things expressly and you've got no worries. I mean, it's all, all nice and straightforward. Um, and there's a, there's a cost to negotiating that documentation and preparing that, but it is almost certainly going to outweigh um, the cost you would otherwise incur having those kind of arguments at lease expiry, it seems to me. Um, but, you know, as usual, nobody wants to pay lawyers a lot of fees when they're dealing with something boring like a license to alter, and, you know, that's um, that's where you get to. I think the, the other problem, because um, there's that NHS property services case, which are brings in great clauses as well with you. Remember that one? Sort of, um, it was the demountable partition. Yes, yes, I do, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, so, where it, I'm trying to think what the other party was, but yes, I, I, I yeah, do remember that one. Yeah. I remember it, was, uh, it was some medical practice up yeah. in the rural, actually, yeah. I remember. But they, um, where they, the court decided that the partitions, you know, which were left, were basically, you know, they were, they were fittings, therefore you haven't vacated the premises. Mm. And even if there were fixtures, there were tenants' fixtures. Yeah, um, which you know, which the tenant should have taken with them, so they couldn't exercise the break. Mm. I think the problem with the license to alter, I think you should make clear what happens to these things. You know, you take them with you or whatever at the end yeah. uh, lease. Uh, but it presupposes that you've actually got a license to alter as well, because you know, sort of minor bits of work around the premises. You're not going to go through a formal license to alter the premises. No. You know, if you've got some industrial unit and you're going to put a chimney, a new chimney on the on the roof or something. You know, the surveyors wouldn't want to go through the whole process of a license to alter. You just do it. And it's very difficult to deal with those kind of things. I mean, I, I think licenses, well, tenants alterations, I think, are really one of those things where um, tenants tend to think it's better to ask for forgiveness than to seek permission beforehand. Um, and, yeah, you get a lot of that. Um, okay, I think we've probably got time for one more um, and an interesting one, one, one for you. Um, how will the courts decide the duration of a lease on renewal under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954? Oh, that should take us to the end. I would have thought so. <laughs> uh, well, you can always agree between the parties, whatever you like, if you agree between the parties. Most people don't obviously want to go to court. What happens in practice in the first instance courts is not necessarily what should happen. You can't get more than a 15-year lease uh, under the 54 Act, unless the parties agree. Um um, the consensus has always been that, I mean, it was the Betty's Cafe in Phillips Furnishing Stores, but it was the Court of Appeal, not the final House of Lords decision, which basically said that you shouldn't get longer than the original lease. But with those provisos and with a lot of exceptions, the tenants get uh, what they're asking for, basically. Um, so if the tenants had a 10-year lease and they want a five-year lease, it's probably not arg worth arguing the case because the tenant's going to get a five-year lease. If the tenant wanted such a short duration of lease, you're going to find it difficult to re-let, then you can argue against it. And I suppose, um, I think it's probably referring to um, one of the cases in my updates. Um, again, I can't believe it's uh, correctly decided. County court case, this B&M case from the late spring of this year. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, so in Billington and Maynham, you know, it's a bargain madness. Yes. <laughs> and the HSBC's yeah. Employees Pension Trust, where, well, the landlord was going to oppose a new lease, but uh, I think there's a message here, and I've heard it happening elsewhere, but uh, the tenant served a Section 26 request, which the landlord didn't uh, counter notice, but opposed on ground F because he wasn't checking his post during the various lockdowns, Yeah, uh, which I think is probably their fault, quite honestly. 
but the tenants wanted a a ten year lease. I think they had a five year lease, in spite of the tenants' wishes. The landlord was going to assign, uh, or sorry, grant a new lease um, to Aldi, and Aldi where it was in the early nineteen eighties. I think it was a garden centre, amongst other things, and they were going to just sort of rebuild it. it was long past its you know use by date. And so the court accepted a, a five-year lease and uh, with a rolling break clause, exercisable at any time. It is a very generous break that, that, that was granted to the landlord in that one. Uh, it was based, I mean, they based it on that um, uh, na uh, National Car Parks and Paternoster Consortium from yeah. the early 1990s, which was much more clear cut. I mean, you can argue that you know the tenants should get their lease. It was Paternoster Square next to St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a World Heritage Site. And any World Heritage Site always benefits greatly from an NCP car park next to it. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was, I think it was underground. And it, you know, yeah. They got public inquiries galore before they could go ahead with their development. Mm. Uh, and so the tenant got their 10-year lease. They originally had a 10-year lease, but the landlord showed that um, you know, starting about... Um, no earlier than two years from now, I might be able to break the lease. So they got a rolling break, redevelopment break, exercisable at any time after two years. Yeah, I tell you something else, Mark, that people don't realise is because if you got a fifty-four hour protected lease and you exercise the break, I'm sure you appreciate this. Hmm. Uh, then all they'll do is sort of bring the fixed term to an end, and you've got your fifty-four hour continuation tenancy. Yeah, but if you make the break clause six to twelve months. You know, you'd have to then serve a Section 25 notice, I suppose, on ground death. But you make the break six to 12 months, and the break can be the Section 25 notice as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, which is quite useful. There's been a more recent case, which I've not, I'm not sure if I got around to mentioning because of the time and the webinar, but it's in the notes, this BMW case. Oh, yes, well, they didn't get they their break option. But they didn't, yeah. well, they, yeah. they couldn't prove that they had intention to occupy for their own purposes some BMW car dealership in Park Lane. Yeah. And they fail, but only on the grounds that they more, more or less admitted that, uh, you know, it was uh, incoherent. Yeah, a very airy, sort of undeveloped idea about. We might have an idea yeah. of running the yeah. business ourselves. Yeah. I mean, I think that I mean, the length of term thing is, um, as you say, you had all those earlier cases like CBS and London Scottish Properties and Cap Charles Follett and Capital and all the rest of it. Um, Whereas you say the general assumption was the tenant will not get a longer term than they want imposed upon them unless it's a very, very, very short term they're looking for. Um, and then we got uh, was it Iceland and Castlebrook about 10 years ago where the landlord split the difference between landlord and the, the, the court split the difference between landlord and tenant. Um, and then the Duke, uh, Duke Minster and West End was another one where the, a, a longer term got ordered. Um, so that was sort of Interesting, and I, and I sort of wondered, um, as a result of the pandemic, where you know all tenants want is short terms and flexibility and break options, whether if that sort of dispute came in front of the court again, a court might think differently. I mean, not, not as, as you know, none of these are binding precedents; they're all county court decisions. And um, there was, wasn't there? Was it one aspect of the H. Put and Boots case? I think okay. it was H. H. Put and Boots just in the last year, um, where um the court did sort of resile from that position of granting a longer term than the tenant wanted and said you know this is all the tenant wants and um given that you know everybody wants flexibility then you know that that's that's that you know that's what we'll do um so i don't know it's um uh, it's a funny one but I, but I think those earlier cases cbs and london scottish etc i don't think they were quoted to the court in oh. iceland and castle or duke or duke minister from west end which is the idea of, i mean in the bmm the hsbc case from i think it was may april may time mm. uh i think they were landlords were very lucky there for numerous reasons mm. Mm. i mean the idea of the tenant wanting a 10-year lease and landlords getting a five-year lease with a rolling break from day one. Yeah. Even though was, there, was, um, there was correspondence from Aldi that suggested that they didn't want to start the development until 2029. Yeah. That just seems yeah. to have been ignored completely. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, what happens in the county court, as I mentioned, is not necessarily what should happen. No. Occasion. No, well, quite. Okay. Um, well, I think that, that deals with that one. So um, that's all we have time for um so uh 
those watching, thank you very much for watching Law 2023 Online, Commercial Property, Shade the Debate. Um, don't forget to join the Solicitors Group Law 2023 Online community on LinkedIn to continue the debate and to be included in exclusive offers for future events. Um, if you purchase the online course, there's still time to watch the pre-recorded content. Uh, your expiry date will be displayed next to the webinar. Um, and for those of you that haven't, there's still time to buy the complete event, including a recording of this session. Um, so to book, just go to uh, www.thesolicitorsgroup.co.uk, uh, where you'll also find the online exhibition that's open for anyone to visit. If you book the entire package, you can claim your uh, free one hour CPD webinar from the webinar learning catalogue, and that's worth an extra £35 plus VAT. Um, so finally, after viewing the online course, please complete the feedback form that's available in the related link section and you'll receive your CPD certificate via email. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you to Richard. Always a pleasure to um, have, these, have these chats and uh, everyone have a great day.